Okay, we're here at Biocultura with Pat Montgomery and we're going to try to ask some questions about the beginning of Clone Lara and how, how was everything started. Uh, hello Pat, how did you end up uh, running a school? Was it something you planned in advance? Well, actually I had been a teacher myself in Catholic schools. I was a nun for 12 years and that was a teaching order. So of course I was a teacher. And then when I came away from the community, I taught in public schools. And so I had already been a teacher. And then I got married and had my own children. And it was at that time that I, my husband and I talked about what would happen to them in five years time. They would be expected to go to school and that was a very frightening thought. For me because I knew school. I had been in school, I had taught in all kinds of schools and different grade levels and different ages of children and I said no I am not sending my children to school, to schools like that. So you decided it was better to, 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 to make a school of your own maybe? Yes, it's the only thing I knew how to do was to make a school of my own that would be um, designed for children, not the other way around, because schools, as we know them, are not designed for children. The children have to design themselves to fit in the schools. And if they succeed, fine, and if they don't, they're just lost. So I decided we could have a school where children were respected, where their opinions were valued, where they had an equal say in what went on in their lives they could help hire the teachers, fire the teachers, and so on. So they did. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's w <laughs> <coughs> that seems very different from regular schools. W what else is different in Clonlara? Well, what's different was that <coughs> because we started with little children, three and four years of age, preschool, and then we added an age a year, more or less, um, we learned from them what their interests were. Uh, for example, we live in Ann Arbor, which is a city of 100,000 people. It has a university in it, which is quite large. There are farms all around it. It wasn't very long into our school that we realized the children would respond when a fire truck went by. What was this? Where, what was the matter? All that siren, what's going on? So we would follow it in our van. And we would take the children to the country when the lambs were being born. And, and a new um, load of chicks came in. And they were just in awe. And so that was the kind of thing we wanted to do. Whatever interested the children, whatever caught their fancy, that's what the school was designed to do. Uh, and c how did you come up with this, with this concept? It's, it's not something that you, you f find easily. Well, no, actually it isn't. Although I did read A.S. Neal, um, who founded Summerhill in the 1920s. And when I read his book, which was published in the States in the 60s, when I read that book, then I felt very much at home. I went to see Neal in England at that time. And um, that's where I got a little bit more confidence about actually starting a school that would be totally different than other schools. Great. Um, what were the beginnings like? Well, um, let's see. I remember one very, very funny thing. You see, my husband and I were not teach were not administrators. We didn't know how to run a school. We we were just doing everything by the seat of our pants, as they say in the states, which means just do what comes next. You don't know what you're doing. So we um, were learning as we went along, and it came time to to put in an order for paper and. Um, knives and forks and um, napkins, uh, serviettes. And so I made the big order and I 
One day when we were with the children in the preschool and we were doing some painting and storytelling, a huge truck came up to the door. And, oh, maybe he lost his way. He wants to know where something is. And he said he has a delivery for Clonara School. Huh. I think there were 78 cartons of toilet paper, which I put the wrong X in the wrong box, don't you see? <laughs> I didn't have a clue when I... So we had so much toilet paper until the children got into high school. I think we had enough toilet paper. <laughs> so that's when I, when I realized that's how you learn, that you don't always have to have somebody to teach you. You can just learn it as you go along. Whenever people came to me in 1960, 19, that was in 67 we started. In 1977, 10 years later, people came and they said, could we, could we, could you help us? We don't want to send our children to school. We want to keep them home. Could you help us? I said, what do you need? And they said, well, no. maybe we no. need... No. Ah, yeah. Maybe we need, um, of some books. Maybe we need uh, whatever yeah. schools yeah. have yeah. that we would like to have. We're not really sure. I was taken back in my mind to the time when I ordered all the toilet paper and I didn't know what I was doing either. That's where they were. And so they said, would you help us? And other school people said, you don't want to help them because that's, that's a conflict of interest. You have a school, they should come to your school. They shouldn't say, I'm going to do it myself. I thought, that's what I did. And nobody stood in my way. Why wouldn't I help them? So that's when we started our home-based education program in 1979. And now that is uh, serving people all over the world. Uh, what makes the school uh, evolve? Ah, that's an interesting question. You know, it's different with almost every group of students. Well, you have a music teacher when somebody can teach music, when somebody knows what they're doing. If you don't have one of those people, you don't have a music teacher. Uh, and the same goes for art, and the same for dance. We always felt responsible if somebody really wanted to learn, say, the French language, we could find someone who spoke French, especially living near a university where native speakers of French were going to school. They could come and teach our children French. And it was our responsibility to have that happen, you see. So that's how it evolves. Sometimes you're going to have someone close by that can teach French, sometimes you're not. When you're not, you hope nobody wants it. When you, when you don't have what somebody wants, the, you do the absolute best you can. But you're not always successful either, you see. So that's pretty much how it evolves. And now that I am not in it every day because I'm retired, it certainly has evolved in a different way than it did when I was in it. Of course, because a lot depends upon personality. The personality of the teachers, the personality of the leaders. So yes, it's a different school now than it was in those days. Uh -huh. And. Why did you choose Spain from all countries? Because Spain is not, is not homeschooling friendly, so to speak. Oh, well, Spain chose us. Uh, one, I got a letter from Xavier uh, Alla uh, in maybe 1995. Please uh, tell us more about Clonlara. Clonlara should help people in Spain. I thought, yeah, that's all I need. It's another full-time job. I can't even speak Spanish. So I put that letter away and maybe I answered by saying, at this time, we cannot help. Next year, Xavier Ala, another letter, same letter. Uh, this guy is persistent. Three years he wrote me the same letter. Finally, I thought, well, already we're helping people in Sweden and in Italy, um, 
Thailand and in India and in Japan. Maybe we could do something in Spain. Maybe I'll go see. So I came to Spain and I visited a woman who had joined our program in 1996 or 97. And so her, I knew, I would visit her. Xavier Allah heard I was going to be at her house. He came 10 hours, all the way from Barcelona down to Al, either Alicante or Almeria. And he, then he said, I am Xavier Allah. I have written to you. I thought, oh, yeah, the persistent one. And he said, when will you help people in Spain? I said, I have no one to speak Spanish and to translate the materials. He opened his suitcase. Here, he had already translated them. But also the curriculum. Here, he had already translated that. So Xavier Alda did everything. And so it was very easy then for me to say, okay, fine, we'll help. <laughs> so then I came to the View Culturas uh, later on and I spoke and uh, Xavier did a very fine job for many years and in not, 10 years ago from this day he he started a different pattern of enrolling people from Spain first they had to enroll directly in the United States Xavier Alla started our program for us here in 2002 they did not have to enroll in the United States anymore they could enroll right through him in Spain. And so that's what we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of now. So it was really due to Xavier Alla that this program developed in Spain. Okay, Pat. Well, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope everybody hears the word and home educates their children. <laughs>